Hi everyone, welcome to my channel. My name is Noelle and I review and unbox subscription boxes here on my channel. And today I have yet another Once Upon a Book Club box to share with you. This is actually the adult selection for December 2021. That does mean I'm getting pretty close to being caught up everyone. So at the beginning of the year I realized that I just had so many book subscription boxes to get caught up on that I actually put this box on hold. So I have about three more that you should hopefully be seeing by the end of the year. I have have sporadically gotten a couple limited editions here and there that you've already seen and I will be sharing the Bridgerton box with you as well once I finally get through that. I have about six more down the rabbit hole book boxes to get through by the end of the year and then the cadence will become a little bit more regular for the book subscriptions. Hopefully I'll be able to read along at a more reasonable rate. So for those of you who love book box subscriptions, thank you so much for joining me in this kind of reading journey, this reading effort at the end of the year. And for those of you who are just watching the video to support the channel. Thank you so, so much. I do really, really appreciate it. I appreciate all the views, all the comments, all the likes. So in case you are new to it, Once Upon a Book Club is a really fun subscription. Every month they put out hints for both their adult selection as well as their young adult selection. The adult selection comes in that pink box and the young adult selection comes in a green box. Of course, you can switch back and forth between the two subscriptions. I know some people like to get both because they just always love the hints. You're also able to skip, so it is kind of nice if there's a book that doesn't really appeal to you or you're kind of behind like I am you can definitely skip for a little bit if you would like to it is $49.99 for the book a printed quote card it's a five by seven a lot of people really love that sometimes there's fun extras like a note from the author or a signed book plate and there's also a little bookmark as well as a reading guide and of course the most important part three to five gifts that are meant to really bring the novel to life they're not always the highest quality items although I will say I have gotten some really nice items in Once Upon a Book Club boxes, but they definitely add to the reading experience. If you are trying to get yourself back into reading, if you're trying to encourage someone else to read and you're thinking of this as a gift, I do think this is a really, really good and fun way to do it. I have a code and a link for you. It is Noelle10. That will save you 10%. And of course, I'll leave that for you in the description box below as well. Sometimes you have to click a little arrow. Sometimes you have to click the three dots. Sometimes you have to click more, but then that should expand. And I always put all kinds of codes codes and links down there for you guys. And if you're ever looking for a particular box or category, make sure you check out my playlist as well because I don't actually have room in that box to list everything every single time. So let's talk about the book that we had for December 2021. Now I have to say I thought it was sort of serendipitous that I wound up waiting so long to read this book. I had no idea when I picked up The Spanish Daughter by Lorena Hughes uh, from my pile of boxes that it actually takes place in Ecuador. So it was actually very awesome because when I turned to that first page and it said Guayaquil, Ecuador, 1920, I was in Guayaquil, Ecuador when I was on vacation a couple weeks ago. And so it just kind of added to the whole experience of reading it. It's not a very big book. It's pretty thin. I thought this was a really lovely addition, I will say. So it actually has the Once Upon a Book Club logo printed on it instead of just being a sticker. But it's got nice thick pages. It's got nice white pages. And it does have that little scoring here on the front and the back so that you're not going to break the binding when you open the book. So I always really appreciate that little details like that really make me happy. And then let me go ahead and find the signed book plate that we also got. So I thought that was a kind of fun touch, as well as the fact that it does have Once Upon a Book Club uh, on there as the border. So you can remember where you got it from. Of course, it's on the, on the book itself. Here, of course, is our little bookmark that has the same quote as the print this time, which is, sometimes it's better to talk about those things that upset us or grieve, give us grief. You may find that it relieves your soul. So here is what that looks like. I thought it was kind of funny, though, because if you look really closely, there's actually two quotation marks at the beginning of that quote. And then on the back, of course, we do have our letter from the author, which I thought was neat. There was kind of a little extra this time around. This might have been something that she had printed for like a book tour, for example, but it was kind of a map of the area around the plantation uh, in Vinces. So it starts in Guayaquil, but that's kind of like the closest big town to Vinces, this place where they are growing the cacao. And then on the back of this, there is a letter. It says, Bienvenido al mundo de the Spanish daughter. Um, but I won't read that letter because we have this one that was written just for Once Upon a Book Club uh, subscribers. And then this is what the book club kit looks like. So you can see the image. Now, again, they send out 
about hints instead of telling you what the actual title is. You could probably figure it out uh, just from those lengthy hints that they do have. But every box, it's labeled more by the hint versus by the month and year because sometimes the shipping isn't always like right on track. So this one, it is the Cocoa Deception. So I'm not really sure. I feel like it should be like the Cacao Deception. I'm not really sure if they have this one in the shop as a one-time purchase, but you can definitely check it out. Now, if it is in there and I read the blurb and it sounds like a book you might want to read, you might want to hold off on watching or you might be convinced by watching and seeing what the gifts are and being like, I actually definitely want to read it now because there is a mystery element to this book, but I don't think that the passages that I'm going to read for you today are going to ruin that for you, if I, if I recall correctly. So let's go ahead and read the letter from the author. I actually haven't read it, so forgive me ahead of time, especially with the Spanish pronunciation because I'm really bad at it. So it says, Dear Reader, the inspiration for Puri's story started with a little spark that was lit, like so many others, while I was casually browsing the internet. I came across a list of women inventors and on it was the name Maria Purificación Garcia, a Spanish woman who was said to have developed the cacao bean roaster in 1847. This would have been a revolutionary invention, but I could unearth very little information on the woman behind it. The only detail I could find was her name in a historical archive in Spain, proof that at least she had it in fact had in fact patented the idea. I learned that women were not allowed to develop in fields such as warfare or medicine, so many of them had to register their patents under their husbands' names. Some even disguised themselves as men in order to pursue their work. I had to do something with all this information, but The Spanish Daughter is not a story about Maria Purificación Garcia. It is a story rooted in the history of my native country in the early 20th century, when Ecuador became one of the top cacao exporting countries in the world. This booming industry took off after a group of French landowners moved to a place called Vinces in the coastal region of Ecuador so they could grow cacao for export. To feel at home, they constructed European-style buildings and even built a small replica of the Eiffel Tower in the town plaza. Vinces, the birthplace of cacao, became known as Paris Chiquito. As I tried to weave together these elements of female inventors, reasons why a woman would have to disguise herself as a man, Ecuador's cacao industry in the early 20th century, and Paris Chiquito, Puri was born, the granddaughter of this remarkable woman inventor, the daughter of a French landowner, and herself a chocolatier who introduces those she meets in the exporting country of Ecuador to the irresistible allure of chocolate. Thank you so much for spending some time with my, no my novel, and I hope you enjoy reading it as much as I enjoyed writing it. I would love to hear what you think and of course where to find her and what hashtags to use. So I was a little bit worried when I started getting into it and I saw like the uh, book club kit. I was like, I hope there's not a chocolate bar that's been sitting in this poor box for like a year. There was not, but I also felt like it was a fair game for uh, getting some chocolate. I will say I saw so many artisan chocolate bars in Ecuador, but they were real expensive, as was the uh, as was the cerveza, like the artisan cerveza. So I didn't actually bring home much chocolate. I did go to the Muse Museo de Chocolate, which was really cool, um, at the equator, and I, I got these, these little truffles that are hand-painted and they look like rocks, they look like gemstones. But of course, the problem with that is now they're so beautiful, I don't want to eat them. So I should have just gotten some chocolate bars that I could demolish. But anyway, I ate some chocolate while I was there because I was reading about chocolate and I had to. So let me go ahead and read the back to you and then you can decide if this is a video you're gonna watch the rest of or if you're gonna hold off and read the book for yourself first. So it says, set against the lush backdrop of early 20th century Ecuador and inspired by the real life history of the coastal town known as the birthplace of cacao, this captivating novel from the award-winning author of the Sisters of Alameda Street tells the story of a resourceful young chocolatier who must impersonate a man in order to survive. As a child in Spain, Purdy always knew her passion for chocolate was inherited from her father, but it's not until his death that she learns of something else she's inherited, a cocoa plantation in Vinces. Ecuador, a town named Paris Chiquito. Eager to claim her birthright and filled with hope for a new life after the devastation of World War I, she and her husband Cristobal set out across the Atlantic Ocean, but it soon becomes clear someone is angered by Puri's claim to the plantation. When a mercenary sent to murder her aboard the ship accidentally kills Cristobal instead, 
Puri dons her husband's clothes and assumes his identity, hoping to stay safe while she searches for the truth of her father's leg legacy in Ecuador. Though freed from the rules that women are expected to follow, Puri confronts other challenges at the plantation, newfound siblings, hidden affairs, and her father's dark secrets. Then there are the dangers awakened by her attraction to an enigmatic man as she tries to learn the identity of an enemy who is still at large, threatening the future she is determined to claim. So sounds like intriguing, right? She has to figure out who is trying to kill her so that they can have more of the inheritance. So there's definitely a lot of half siblings involved. Um, I had to have a little willing suspension of disbelief uh, because she is in such close proximity to both men and women. I couldn't quite believe that she could don a, a convincing fake beard and that people would actually believe this woman was a man. Uh, she tells all of them that she herself, Puri, is the one who uh, died on the ship from like Spanish influenza. Um, and it just didn't seem that believable. But once I got past that, I was like, okay. Just enjoy the book. It's going to be good. And it was, it was really a fun read. So let me go ahead and start with our first gift, which was on page 41. So this is what the sticky notes look like when you come across them. And I will read this one. So she is there dressed like, dressed like her husband, Cristobal. It says, as Aquilino continued reading, he is the lawyer that's reading the will, essentially, in that monotone he used every time he opened his mouth, Angelica fanned herself faster. She is one of the half-sisters. I resisted the urge to turn in her direction. I could only imagine the resentment that a woman like Angelica might feel about not being her father's primary beneficiary. Don Cristobal, Aquilino said, lifting his head from the paper. Ecuadorian law is specific when it comes to inheritances. With Doña Purificación's passing, her portion of the will is to be divided among her siblings. He watched each of us over the rim of his glasses. Heirs are only allowed to leave 25% of their assets to whoever they choose, but the rest, I'm afraid, must stay in the family. So Puri is uh, actually, they've given the name of the plantation uh, Puri, but it is short for Purificación. So they think that Doña Purificación is dead and that Cristobal is there to claim her portion of the inheritance inheritance, which is a huge section. So, all right. So it was actually going to be all left to Puri, but because they think it's just the husband, he only gets a part of it. So it's better for them, but still not the best. So you would think that whoever uh, sent someone out to kill her would have thought about that and realized that her husband would still also get some. So here is our gift. And of course, it's a lovely box that they've had printed just for this occasion uh, with some cacao beans on it. I've said it before, I will say it again. I wish they didn't print the page numbers on the boxes because then you would be able to uh, re-gift them. And inside we have Angelica's fan, which I thought that was a cool gift to receive, even though this was a December box. So very, very pretty. Let me show you the other side. Goes all the way around and then it does have this kind of handle where you just stick that in, kind of like lift it up so it stays in place and you can fan yourself and be, you know, so you can fret over the fact that your father has left most of the plantation to his his legitimate daughter and you are not getting nearly as much as you would have liked. Then on page 135, let me find this one. Let me see if I can remember what this one is all about. Let me see, I might have to open the gift. So here are some cacao beans. They kind of look like coffee beans, right? Let me see if I can remember what passage this is, if I can open the box because sometimes that jogs my memory. I didn't have the gifts with me when I was traveling because that would be a lot to carry. So this is in the voice of one of the other sisters. I believe this is actually in Angelica's voice. So they are getting ready for an event. It says, the guests were gathering downstairs already. My hands trembled as I put my sapphire earrings on. Sylvia had been right. Blue suited me. My mother had agreed blindly with all of Sylvia's suggestions, not caring much for terrestrial, terrestrial affairs herself. So she's telling a little bit of the history of her mother, um, of course, and it is the father that Puri sh shares with Angelica, who has passed away. So inside of that lovely box, we got the sapphire earrings that Angelica is wearing. Of course, these beautiful blue earrings, probably glass, are not real sapphires, but they kind of give the effect. And then on the backer card, it says the same quote. It says, my hands trembled as I put my sapphire earrings on. Sylvia had been right. Blue suited me, but I thought that was kind of nice. Attention to detail, right? We have the box that has the cacao beans. We have the backer card with the quote. And then of course we have the nice little dangly gold and blue earrings. Hopefully they're glass. So the next one was on page 211. 
Let me see if I can find this one and hopefully I can remember what this gift was all about. So I do highly suggest reading it at home so that you can read the gifts because it was very hard for me to like come to a page with a sticky note and then be like, I don't get to open it until later. Sometimes if the uh, passage is towards the end of the page, they'll have to use like a smaller sticky note like that, like a little half one. So let me see. So she is still in disguise as Cristobal, even this far along, but she realizes that all of these people on these plantations, um, they actually haven't uh, tasted chocolate. They just do the exporting and they haven't learned how to make chocolate, which is kind of sad. So she's going to do it. So it says, I thanked her and added as a truce, I would like to reciprocate your kindness with a small token of my appreciation, something that I'm certain my puri would have liked very much. I spent the rest of the afternoon preparing chocolate drinks and truffles for Laurent and my sisters. So Laurent is the French husband of one of the sisters. Just like Martine and Bachita, my sisters were in awe as the beans transformed in the mill. Laurent, not so much. He said he tasted better in his native country. It must be the ingredients. They're pure in France such a jerk Laurent. So this is what we got for this one, this beautiful drawstring bag, again with the page number printed on it, but definitely reusable nonetheless. And inside, I thought this was kind of a fun one, we got this uh, silicone mold for making like cho hot chocolate bombs, or of course you can make like big truffles in them, kind of chocolate colored. And then we have even a recipe for hot cocoa bombs, which I thought was very, very cool. On the other side, it just shows us a chocolate bar, which I'm kind of wishing we got that, but I thought that was a really, really fun um, interpretation. Um, I was kind of hoping secretly that there was chocolate in there, but it probably wouldn't have been that great after sitting all beside me here for an entire year. And then finally, we've got one final gift. This one I thought was kind of silly in all honesty, but Nice way to end everything, and that came on page 259. They did a great job of really spreading the gifts out as well, which I really enjoyed. So let me see. Um, we did have another one as well, a smaller one. Okay, so finally, the big reveal. It says, as my siblings and my father's lawyer stared at me, I removed my spectacles and set them on the coffee table. Then I pulled off my beard and mustache, relieved that this would be the last time I would ever have to wear that dreadful thing. Their faces transformed from confusion to shock. As I removed my jacket, so relieved as if I'd been unlocking a pair of handcuffs from my wrists, I spoke with my regular voice. I'm Maria Purificacion. I raised my chin. I was not ashamed of what I'd done, especially now that I'd figured everything out. So now she knows who tried to kill her, why she's like uncovered all kinds of other family secrets, and she's gonna tell all as herself. So last one, we got this big gift for page 259. So that's just like a nice mailer bag that we can toss after the fact. Um, so we got a couple of items. One is just kind of silly. We actually got the fake beard and mustache, which, you know, I thought this was kind of silly um, that they gave it to us at the end, but luckily it did come with something else because if this was the only gift that we got, that would be kind of a throwaway because what are you going to do with that, right? But I thought this was kind of funny, right? It just comes like this and then we can put our beard and mustache on. But if this is how believable it was, I don't think uh, they would have gone for it. But there it is, very silky, very smooth. And we also got very crushed this kind of cool hat that she wore. So it actually fluffed up pretty well and I haven't actually laid it flat. I might get it a little bit damp. It just has this faux leather cord on it and then it's got like a nice little band right here. You can see where it's bound. But what a great little sun hat. I actually thought that was really cute. So let's go ahead and see if I can put my beard on you guys. I don't know if this is gonna work. I don't think this is gonna work. I should have just used my own hair, right? There, there's my, there's my beard and mustache, you guys. And there is my hat. Do I look like a guy? I don't know, but I thought this was a really fun book. I thought this was kind of a silly gift. The hat is not that bad though. I could see using it as a beach hat. But you guys let me know what you thought in the comments below. If you appreciated this video, please help me out. Let me pull my mustache down a little bit more. There we go. Please help me out with a thumbs up and I'll see you all very, very soon in my next unboxing. <laughs>